Diary of a Wimpy Kid. No brainer. April, Monday. The human brain is supposed to be this amazing supercomputer that's it, that's capable of all sorts of incredible stuff. But if that's true, then I don't know why my brain is always making me do stupid things. Watch. It's actually a little annoying because if you think about it, your brain's one job is to be smart. Pop. Mm. Poke, wobble. I guess it's my own fault for filling my brain with things that aren't important, like video game cheat codes and theme songs to old TV shows, because now there's no room left for stuff that actually matters. The problem with the brain is that there is only a limited amount of room in there, so eventually, you run out of storage. And the reason it's hard for old people to learn new things is because their brains are just full. It's called social media. And you want to like something? You just press this little heart. Bah. One of these days, they're going to figure out a way to add more memory. And when they do, I'm going to buy myself the biggest booster pack I can afford. In the meantime, I'm trying to be really choosy about what I put in my brain. So when someone's telling me something, I don't need to know. I just try and block it out. So then Mrs. O'Malley says she wasn't the one who called me a liar. So I asked her why she was talking to Mrs. Gregson behind my back. La 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 la, I can't hear you. Munch, munch. When you're a kid, the thing that you use your brain for the most is school. And a lot of your brain power goes to memorizing useless stuff, like the names of vice presidents and the words to preschool songs. If you are happy and you know it and you really want to show it, the one thing that's really inconvenient is that your brain is inside your head. So you have to take it everywhere you go. But if they figure out a way to deal with that issue, then school is going to be a whole different thing. I think it would be great if your brain could be at school learning while you're off doing things you actually enjoy, like playing laser tag with your friends or hanging out at the arcade. Then you could pick up your brain at the end of the day and get all caught up. So what did you learn at school today? Nothing. For now, I guess we're stuck with the current situation where your body and your brain need to be in the same place. And if you're a kid, that means you've got to spend a big chunk of your time at school. My problem with that is how long the school day is. You're there for seven hours, but you probably only spend 20 minutes a day on actual learning. And that's because most of your time is spent on stuff that doesn't have anything to do with education. Uh, today, in fifth period, we spent zero time learning about history because a B got loose in the classroom. And that pretty much killed the chance of anything productive happening. I wish everyone would stop fooling around and just get down to business when school starts. Because that's why we could get the learning part over with and be out of there before lunchtime. But I think they like to stretch things out and keep you there for as long as possible. The whole reason school was invented in the first place is because back in olden times, kids were causing too many problems at home while their parents were at work. So they created this whole system with textbooks and lockers and algebra and phys ed just to keep kids out of trouble for a few hours every day.
you're in school from the time you're four until you're at least 18. And after you're done with your education, you have to get a job and work until you reach old age. So by the time you're through with all that, you're too tired to do anything fun. If they really wanted to, they could probably teach you everything you actually need to know by the time you're five or six. But I guess grants don't want to have to compete with their kids for good paying jobs. Congrats, grades. So they teach you a little bit at a time so you don't get too smart too quick. And sometimes they teach you stuff you can't even use. That's what's been happening at my school lately. I just took three months of Latin with a teacher named Mr. Layton, and it was my favorite class. But it turns out he didn't know Layton at all. And was teaching us nonsense the whole time. Esca tu so namrusco. Imso Giorgioro. When the school found out Mr. Layton was a fraud, they fired him. So now all I've got to show for the last three months of my life is knowing how to order a hamburger in a language that doesn't even exist. Mr. Layton isn't the only one teaching us stuff we can't really use. My social studies teacher is Mrs. Laffey. And this year is her last year. So the only countries she teaches us about are the ones she's planning on visiting with her husband after she retires. And for our last homework assignment, she had us research which cruise ships have the best meal plans. Some of our teachers don't even bother trying to teach us anything at all. Miss Pitchard is supposed to be teaching us geometry, but she uses us but she uses her new smart board for stuff like helping her pick out which breed of puppy to get. A few of other teachers are doing their best, but as kids don't always make it easy for them. Mr. Rask tried teaching science the regular way for half of the year, but nobody seemed interested. So he switched to teaching about grass stuff. And even though it makes science a lot more interesting, I don't think any of the information we're learning right now is going to help us get a good college later on. I wish I didn't know half of the stuff I've learned in Mr. Rask's class. Because ever since we watched the video about the microscopic parasites living inside our skin, I can't stop scratching. Itch, itch, scratch, scratch. We don't know, have, we don't even have an algebra teacher anymore. Mr. Kwan went to maternity leave because back in October and they never found a long-term sub to fill in for her. So during fourth period, they just stick us in a computer lab and we and have us go on this math game website, which is sponsored by a candy company. God smashers match. How many more fruity metal the God Smashers can fit in Billy's mouth before he busts? A, 34, B, 37, C, 43, D, 53. D, 54. Now, everyone in my grade needs candy to do maths. And when we took a standards, standardized test, test last month, a bunch of kids brought packs of jelly beans and bubble gum to help them count. Chew, chew. 43, 44, 45. Check, check. I probably would have done a lot better on the test if I wasn't sitting behind a kid who went through an entire jar of gob math smashers. Crunch. It wasn't just the math section that was hard, though. The reading section had a bunch of essays, and the science section had questions about stuff we never covered in class. And there wasn't a single question about farts or burps. So when our school's results came back, it wasn't a surprise that our scores were the lowest in the state. In fact, our scores were so bad, we made the news. Middle school's performance nosedives.
A lot of parents were pretty upset, including mine, and I guess the superintendent when, was under pressure to make big changes because he fired our principal, Mr. Mansi, and asked the old principal, Mr. Bottoms, to come out of retirement. I'm actually surprised Mr. Bottoms agreed to come back because the way my older brother Roderick described it, when Mr. Bottom retired a few years ago, he went out with a big bag. Woo-hoo! But I'm rooting for him to return things around because based on my education so far, the only job I'm going to be qualified for is cruddy middle school Latin teacher. I'm Burgoro. Friday. Principal Bottoms has only been in charge for a few days, but has already made some big changes. And any class that doesn't teach stuff that's on standardized tests has been cut, which kind of stinks because we had just started the brownie baking units in our home EC comics class. Snips. Things have gotten a lot more serious in the classes that weren't cut like science Mr. Rask isn't teaching about body smells and things like that anymore. But that doesn't mean the stuff we're learning isn't gross, because this week he announced we are starting a dis dissection unit on tap worms. Luckily, there weren't enough tap worms to go around, so me and my partner, Tyler Gire, had to work with some noodles from the cafeteria instead. Tyler takes this science stuff pretty seriously, though, and you'd never think he was upbraiding on leftover pasta. Scalpel. I guess maybe Tyler will glow up to be a surgeon one day, but I hope I don't end up on his upbraiding table because I'll know exactly where he got his education. Greg. Greg Heffley. Gah! Everybody thinks learning science is great, but they never talk about the flip side of things. I've seen a bunch of movies where a scientist loses their mind and tries to take over the world. But you never see any movies where the villain is mad zookeeper or a mad gardener. So when it comes to science, I think the less you know, the better. Because I don't need to be the guy who messes around and accidentally opens up a portal to the demon realm. Scream! Tyler Gray says that if we ever get to operate on real tap worms, he's going to try to bring one back to life by hooking it up to electrodes. And this is exactly the type of things I'm worried about. If you ask me, you shouldn't go screwing around trying to bring the dead back to life. On top of it, just being wrong. It could also be pretty awkward. I feel bad I never sent my grand aunt Reba a thank you card for the birthday money she gave me a few years ago. So I don't know what I'd say to her if she was back in the picture all of a sudden. Sorry I couldn't find stamps. Hey, sir. When I'm gone, I hope my family doesn't try to bring me back to life. Because if I'm coming back means having, a, having to babysit my great, great, great grandkids. I'd rather everyone just tell me to rest in peace. We'll be back after the movie. But I probably shouldn't worry about someone in my class being a big scientific breakthrough because you need the proper equipment for that sort of thing. And my school can't even afford to give everyone the right kind of protective eyewear. So people have been bringing their own gear from home. The science lab isn't the only place in our school that doesn't have the proper equipment, though. Half of the laptops in the computer center have missing letters on their keyboards. And last week, I got bad grade on history paper when I had to use a computer that was missing all the vowels. Gurg. Hifli. Wurlad. History. Nakind. Permans. Tassens. F. Yours, G, Concentrant, F, Magnificent, 
structures was started and nascent Jijak. T. Naturals were sent stand. The area of the school were where shortest on the materials in the library because a lot of the shelves are empty. But it wasn't always like that. Back in September, we got a new librarian named Miss Massey, who created a graphic novel section and filled it with books she paid with her own money. The most popular books were from the series called Commando Crocodile. And no matter how many copies she bought, Miss Massey couldn't keep them on the shelves. If you wanted to check out a copy, you had to put your name on a list that was a mile long. Commando Crocodile, Full Swing. Commando Crocodile, Tunnel Vision. But I guess some parents had a problem with the way Commando Crocodile was drawn. So they filled out a complaint form, Library Book Challenge form. Name of book, Commando Crocodile, Tunnel Vision. Author, Maddie Shubb. Reason for challenge, Crocodile is not wearing pants. Apparently, the rule is that if one parent complains about a book, it has to be removed from the library. But Miss Massey came up with a compromise to keep the series on the shelves. She used a marker to draw pants on Commando Crocodile, and that seemed to satisfy the parents who made a stink about it. Creaky, this block just won't quit. I got a bone to pick with your mate, Trunk. It's getting a little chokers in here. But then a new problem cropped up. Some kids had their own uncensored copies of Commando Crocodile at home, and they brought them to school. And when Principal Bottoms found out about it, he confiscated their copies. So then the school started checking our bags for Commander Crocodile books at the beginning of the day, which added 15 minutes to get through the doors. Security checkpoint. Please place bags on table. But kids are smart, and some of them figured out ways to sneak books into school anyway. It turns out that the complaints were contagious because some parents suddenly noticed that there were a bunch of books in the library that had animals without any clothes. So then, Miss Massey had to spend her time dealing with that issue. Eventually, Miss Massey gave up and put all the books that were challenged in a back room. And if you wanted to read them, you had to go get a permission slip from a parent. After a while, there were more books in the band section than the main library. So the school had to write to all the parents and ask them to donate books from home. But that just gave everyone an excuse to unload all the books they didn't want. South County, phone book, fabulous fungi, Kulik refrigerator model, operating manual, teacher cat sign language. If you ask me, I think the whole book banning thing backfired. A lot of people donated romance novels, and the stuff in them is a lot more inappropriate than anything in Commando Crocodile. Winds of Desire. My mom says those types of books aren't real literature, but I figure as long as a person is reading, it's a good thing. Wednesday. Principal Bottoms is trying to encourage kids to get better grades. So last week, he created this new program called the High Flyers Club, which is kind of like one of those airline rewards programs. This basic idea is that the better you do in school, the more rewards you earn. High Flyers Club. The kids in the High Flyers Club get all sorts of perks, like preferred seatings in the classroom with extra leg room. But that kind of stinks for the rest of us because now there's less space for everyone else. In geometry, there wasn't a lot of room to begin with. So to make extra space for the high flyer flyers, they had to take out a whole row of seats. That means kids like me who used to sit in the back row have to sit on the heater. 
And that thing is so hot that if you stay still so too long, your butt could burst into flames. So you have to shift from one cheek to the other to give each a break. What? 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 But extra legroom isn't the only thing we're jealous about. The high flyers get snacks and drinks during class, which they're not allowed to share with the rest of us. When they're not in class, the high flyers get to use the teacher's lounge. And I've heard the teachers aren't too thrilled with the part of that deal. I'm not too bothered that those kids can use the teacher's lounge, but I'm jealous that they get to use the bathroom in there. I've heard it's a no, it's a one seater, and I really need my privacy when I go. I wouldn't go in there for a little while. The high flyers even have their own separate entrance when they get to school, so they breeze through security in the morning. On top of that, the high flyers get let out of school before everyone else, and even though it's only five minutes earlier. That's still plenty of time to get a head start on the bullies. Everyone wants to be part of the High Flyers Club, but it's not easy to get in. You need to have straight A's in all your classes, and there's only a handful of kids smart enough to actually pull that off. So some kids have been cheating to try and get better grades, and they've been coming up with some pretty ingenious ways to do it, too. In geometry, Adam Katz wrote a bunch of equations on the back of a sticker on his water bottle so he could look at them during a test. And he might have gotten away with it if he wasn't so obvious about what he was doing. In science, a kid named Dan Fell actually made a fake arm, which he put on top of his desk during the test, that looked up answers on the phone he was holding underneath the desk. The only reason he got busted was because he got a notification in the middle of the test. Ding. Some kids have been teaming up to cheat. A few girls in my history class wrote the names of the most important battles of the Civil War on the backs of their necks. Then they removed the hair out of the way once the test started. And in English, a bunch of kids created this crazy system of communicating answers to each other by using Morse codes and by with their pens but nobody let me in on what they were up to. The cheating's become such a big problem that today the school had an assembly to deal with it. They brought in this guy named Clarence Cluster, who said he started cheating when he was in middle school, which ruined his whole life. And now I think his story actually shook a few kids up. Clarence Cluster cheated. But I'm 90% sure that this guy's name wasn't even Clarence Cluster, and he was just an actor the school brought in to scare us. That's because he looked exactly like one of the characters in a dinner theater show my parents went to over the summer. Be your guest, be your guest. If the school really wanted to get through to us about how dishonesty can ruin your life, they should have brought in school's very first principal, Larry Mack, but I guess they couldn't do that since he's still in prison. If the name Larry Mack sounds similar, it's because his family owns a giant chain of car dealerships out in one route. And he's still on a bunch of old billboards nobody even bothered to take down. Let him, Larry sent down. But Larry Mack didn't start off in the car business. He was the principal of the middle school for 10 years, and after he got famous for his car dealership, they named the school after him, Larry Mack Middle School. He was so popular that Eamon made a statue of him, which they put in front courtyard. But after Larry Mack opened his fifth car dealership, some reporters started poking around, trying to learn how he got the money to start his business. With a little detective work, they figured out he'd been stealing from the middle school for years, and it was a huge scandal at the time. On Daily Herald, and of the road of ex-principal. From what I heard, the police arrested him at his dealership right in the middle of a sale. 
After that, the school took down the statue, or at least the Mary Lack part of it. Larry Mack part of it. The only evidence that he was ever there in his shoes, which they couldn't get off of the pedestal. They never did change the name of the school, though, and I think that's because some people like being linked to someone famous, even if that person's famous for doing a terrible thing. You'd think people in my town would be embarrassed to have their middle school named after a crook, but nobody around her seems to bother by it. Even the school mascot, the looter, was inspired by Larry and Matt. Go, looters! Steal a win! The fact that Larry Mack landed in prison didn't stop him from making money, though. He wrote an autobiography, which apparently sold a ton of copies. I know my school bought at least 50 of them because they took up two whole shelves in the Larry Mack section of life. Drive how to succeed in life and business. A kid named Albert Sandy, who sits at my lunch table, said that Larry Mack only used half of the money he stole to start his car dealership, and he buried the other half under the school. Arr, that got everyone all stirred up, and people started bringing in tools from home to try to find Larry Mack's secret treasure. Ding, ding, clunk, clink, clink. Last week, the kid named Danny Tang got the idea that the money could be hidden in the walls. So he broke a hole through the back of his locker to see if he could find anything. Unfortunately for me, Danny's locker is on the other side of mine, and now there's nothing between them. To make things worse, kids figured out that the hole between our lockers was a shortcut from the A wing to the B wing of the school. So now, whenever I open my locker between classes, there's always a line of kids waiting to get through. Danny decided to try to make a little money off the situation, and he started charging people to take the shortcut to his locker, so that gave some other kids the idea to create shortcuts of their own chunk clang. But not every locker came next to one of the other side, and Christian Mackey found out the hard way that his locker shares a wall to the principal's private bathroom. After that, Principal Bottoms put his foot down, so now we're not allowed to bring any kind of digging tools to school, which means... It takes twice as long to get the security in the morning. Friday. It turns out Principal Bottom was the only one getting started with the new rules because now there are a bunch of them. The latest rule is that if you're in the hallway while class is in session, you need to have the hall pass. And I kind of see... And I can kind of see why Principal Bottoms made that change because sometimes it seems like there are more kids in the hallway than there in the classrooms. But as soon as Principal Bottoms came up with that rule, kids just started making their own hall passes and the hall monitors couldn't tell which one were fake and which one were real. So Principal Bottoms made a new rule that every teacher had to have their own unique hall pass that would be easy for us kids to fake. Now, Madden left Rose Hall Pass is a big French English dictionary. And Mr. Bald's Hall Pass, he is his used size 14 basketball shoe. Miss Rascal's Hall Pass is a human skeleton which you attach to your wrist with rubber bands. I decided it's not even worth asking Mr. Rask if you can use the bathroom during this class because the whole experience is just way too embarrassing. Speaking of the bathroom, there's a new rule about how long you're allowed to actually be in there. Apparently, teachers are complaining that kids were hanging out in the bathrooms too long. So the new deal is that you are supposed to be in and out of there within a minute. They even had a whole assembly on how to get everything done in 60 seconds. Number one, do your business. Number two, wash your hands. Number three, leave. It's one thing to make a rule, but it's another thing to enforce it. The school appointed a handful of kids to be bathroom monitors. 
and gave them whistles and stopwatches and everything. But all the bathroom monitors ended up quitting because it turns out people don't like being rushed when they're trying to use the facilities. Quit. Once the monitors were gone, kids hung out in the bathrooms longer than ever. Chris Cardia, whose dad is a barber, even started up his own little business in the A-Wing boys' room. The school ended up removing the mirrors from all the bathrooms to get us to hurry things along. And now I have to rely on my best friend, Rolly, to tell me I've got something in my nose. The booger check. I don't know what it's like in the girls' bathroom, but in the guys' bathroom, it's just a total zoo. And I guess the reason is because it's the only place in the school that's unsupervised by adults. Every once in a while, though one of the male teachers will pop their head in and tell everyone to quiet horsing around, hey, knock it off in here. But in the B-Wing, all the teachers are women, so the boys know they can totally go nuts in the bathroom without anybody coming in to tell them to cut it out. And it gets so crazy that I won't even go in there unless it's urgent. I heard that recently things got so out of hand in the B-Wing bathroom that Mr. La Mrs. Lackey had to go inside to talk to it, but she had to wear a blindfold so she sh didn't violate anyone's privacy, which meant nobody actually got in any trouble. After that, things were worse than ever. On Wednesday, Justin Murdoch got called down to the principal office for writing on the bathroom wall with a marker. And on Thursday, George Cantos got in trouble for hanging from one of the stalls and bending the frame. Justin and George both got detention, and all the guys became paranoid because they thought someone had to be a snitch. But eventually, they figured out how they were getting busted. There's a metal paper towel dispenser in the B-Wing bathroom. And if you're in the hallway, you can see what's going on by looking at the reflection. So that's how the teachers busted Justin and George for doing what they did. Aha! The thing is, the reflection is blurry. So even though the teachers can kind of see what's going on in the bathroom, it's not perfect. That's how I got sent to the principal office for something I didn't even do. Principal Bottom said a teacher reported me for breaking the hell of a urinal. And I know for a fact the kid who actually did that was Meyer T. Vinson because I overheard him bragging about it in the cafeteria. Bloosh. But I wasn't going to snitch to on Mary Vinson since he's the kind of kid who can make your life miserable. So I just sat there and took it while Principal Bottom chewed me out for being a vandal. Principal Bottoms made me fill out a self-evaluation form, which is another one on his new policies. All I can say is I hope that doesn't end up on my permanent record because I've already got enough bad stuff on there as it is. Larry Mack Middle School, self-evaluation form. Nature of infrastructure, broken urinal, have a look. How did this happen? No clue. How did this make your classmates feel? They thought it was pretty hilarious. How can you avoid this kind of behavior in the future? Be more gentle and flushing. Thursday. I guess Principal Bottoms finally went a little too far with the new rules because kids are starting to push back. But this isn't about hall passes or bathroom rules. It's about fudge dogs. If you never heard of fudge dogs before, it's because my school is the only place you can get them. And that's because they weren't invented here. This actually happened by accident. Last year, the school tried introducing some healthier options at lunch and they replaced beef hot dogs with tofu ones. <clears throat> and let's just say they weren't a big hit with students. But two. The school had hundreds of uneaten tofu dogs and were planning on just throwing them all away. But when a cafeteria lady <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
named Mrs. Podsner dumped the tofu dog in a trash. One of them fell into a vat of hot fudge and that was mixed for that day's ice cream sundae bar. I guess she got curious. So Mr. Podster took out a bite of fudge-covered tofu dog, and when she did, she knew she had invented a whole new food type. A few days later, fudge dogs were officially on the menu, and from the moment they went on sale in the cafeteria, they were a smash hit. Fudge dogs are here. In fact, they were so popular that the kids in the first two lunch periods were buying up all the fudge dogs and reselling them at higher price than the kids who had lunch later on. And Ricky Fisher made a killing doing that. Cafeteria sales went up to 60% and the school even held an assembly where Mrs. Podsner got the recognition she deserved. Thank you, Mrs. P. Now there are Fudge Dogs Fridays, where it buys two and get one free. And you get all sorts of toppings at the fudge station, like rainbow sprinkles and miniature marsh uh, marshmallows. The school even held a fall fudge festival, where there were all sorts of Fudge Dog-themed activities for the whole family. Dunk Fudge Nose. Me and Rowley entered the fudge dog tower competition, but once we got ours four feet high, the whole thing collapsed. Other schools in the area heard about our fudge dogs and tried to create their own, but apparently they used beef hot dogs and it wasn't the same. Some kids from Slapsville actually broke into our school on a Sunday night to try to steal our secret recipe, but luckily, Mrs. Posner was working late making that wheat batch of fudge dogs, and she caught them in the act. Fudge dogs have become such a big deal at our school that we recently replaced our old mascot with one named Fudgy. And now other schools hate coming to our gym to play us in basketball. Squirt. People around here just love their fudge dogs, so you can probably imagine how shocked everyone was to come to school and find out fudge dogs had been cancelled. Sorry, kids. No fudge dogs. Principal Spottom was the one who made the decision. The school hired some company to help figure out why test scores had fallen so sharply. And the answer was the Fudge dogs were at the root of it. Apparently, visits to the nurse's office have skyrocketed ever since fudge dogs were introduced, and kids have been missing a ton of class time. I've never personally gotten sick from eating a fudge dog, but I'll admit that whenever I have more than one, I don't feel like I'm at my best. And a lot of kids have gotten into a habit of taking a nap right after lunch, especially on fudge dog Fridays even though everyone knows fudge dogs probably aren't good for you. It was still a shock when they got discontinued, and on Monday, students staged a walkout to protest the decision. Bring back fudge dogs! Principal Bottoms tried to calm things down by introducing a new fun food to the menu, and Fudge Friday, Fudge Dog Fridays got replaced with Macaroni Mondays. The school even put posters up in the hallways to try to get kids excited. Who's ready for macaroni Mondays? Me. But serving a bunch of angry middle schoolers macaroni was just asking for trouble. Things got so out of control that Principal Bottoms had to meet with the student council to see if they could come up with a solution together. Principal Bottoms said it follow. It allowed fudge dogs back on the menu as long as kids had one piece. But the student council said that that was too harsh and a limit should be two per person. So they split the difference and landed on one and a half fudge dogs per student per day. And ever though nobody was completely satisfied, it seemed like a good compromise. But if they're wondering why it all, why what happens to all the extra fudge dog house, 
Mrs. Podsner created a whole new food type for the second time in six months, and that's got to be some kind of record. Watch dog fingers are here. Friday. One of the reasons kids in my school don't take their education seriously enough is because we don't have a lot of good role models. The most famous person to come out of our school is Larry Mack, who went to prison. And the second most famous person is his son, Larry Mack Jr., who dropped out to take over the family business when his dad got put away. But I don't think Larry Mack Jr. has any regrets about not finishing his education because from his ads, he seems he's just doing fine. Don't bring your backs on lemon. His family looks like it's doing all right, too. Larry Mack Jr. has a bunch of kids, and he uses them in his television ads, and people can't get enough of his youngest son, Larry Mack Jr. Jr. Beep, beep. I actually feel like a little bad for that kid, because with a name like that, his only choice in life is to take over the car dealership when his dad decides to hand it up. So anything he does between now and then doesn't really matter. I think it's kind of crazy that your parents come up with your name before you're even born. And then you're stuck with it for the rest of your life. It feels to me like you need to get to know a person before picking a name that fits them. In some cultures, they would a year before they decide a permanent name. But that's still probably not enough time. Because if my parents named me when I turned one, I would have ended up with a pretty terrible name. We shall call him... Gregory Betramori Pupitan. Other cultures let kids come up with their own names once they're old enough, but I'm not sure that's not a great idea either. Because if you let kids my age name themselves, they'll probably just end up using their video game handles as their permanent names. Harmless Potato 196, Squiddy Inkster, Model Z Toys 1989. Some people legally change their names, but I don't see the point of going through all that hassle because I'll bet my family would just keep calling me by my old name anyway. Would you like some more garlic bread, Greg? I told you, it's Techno Laser Rack. Sometimes I wonder if I'd be a completely different person if I was just named something a little cooler. New Champion. Rock bold or have it. But maybe your name has nothing to do with the person you turn into because there's a girl at my school whose first name is Angel and that doesn't seem to have made any difference in her case. Back in olden times, your last name was just whatever you did for a living and even though that made things simple, it must have made it really hard if you wanted to switch jobs. What make you think you can handle this type of work, Mr. Candlemaker? Heavy duty construction. Nowadays, you can be whatever you want to be. And I've got big plans for how I'm going to make a name for myself. Fifth animal fudge dog eating competition. But if I ever get... But if I ever do get famous... But if I ever get famous, I'm going to be real careful about my name gets used. Because the last thing you want is to have your name on something that hurts your reputation. Greg Hefley, Sandwich Treatment Facility. If I was Larry Mack Jr., I wouldn't want my family name on one of the worst performing middle schools in the state. Because that definitely couldn't be, can't be good for their car dealership. The crazy thing is, if Larry Mack Jr. would just return some of the money his dad took from our school, it would help us turn things around. But ever since his family moved out of town a long time ago, Larry Mack Jr. probably hasn't given a second thought to the middle school name after, named after his father. Last summer, the state decided to build a new baseball stadium, and to pay off for it, they had to take money away from the fire department, the library, and the schools. And people were protesting outside the stadium over the budget cuts. Stadium, no. The worst thing is that since our school did so bad on the standardized tests, we got the most money. 
taken away. So now I guess we're supposed to do more with less. Principal Bottoms has made all sorts of new rules to help the school save money, starting with capping the amounts of materials each kid is allowed to use per week. It is used to be that if you wanted to use the stapler or a couple of paper clips, you just took what you needed off the teacher's desk. But now each kid gets 19 staples and six paper clips a quarter, plus four glue stick stripes. If you need more than that, you've got to bring your own supplies from home. And Ricky Fisher's been taking advantage of the situation because his mom works at a local office supply store and gets stuff at a discount. The students aren't the only ones who get less materials to work with. Each teacher only gets one dry erase marker per week. So they have to make it last. And sometimes I feel like most of teachers skims over important stuff just to save mark their fluid. World history. When something breaks in a classroom, they don't even bother to fix it anymore. Last week, the handle on a pencil sharpener broke off in geometry, and everyone had to gnaw their pencils to a point so they could take the quiz. Lately, people have started handing Ruby Bird their pencils to ask her to sharpen them, and I'm not still exactly sure how that works. But classroom supplies are just the tip of the iceberg because the school is taking all sorts of steps to make it pennies go further. Earlier this week, the school started cutting off the heat after lunch. And by the time sixth period rolls around, you'd better hope you remember to grab your coat out of your locket The one that not that's not freezing is science, and that's because we've been firing up buns and burners to keep warm, but I'm a little nervous because we only have enough propane to last another week or two. The school's been scrimping on electricity, too. To save money, they shut off the overhead lights in the ceiling, and you can tell which kids have their lockers in that section of the school because they're the ones who walk into homeroom with dilated pupils. The only kid who doesn't seem to mind that lights are off in C-Wing is Evelyn Trimble, but everybody says she might actually be a vampire. Screams! Another way the school decides to save some money was by canceling their contract with the exterminator. So now, on top of everything else, we've got to deal with cockroaches that are so big you can hear them when they walk in a room. Step, step, step. At first, when every kid spotted a cockroach, they stepped on it. But the teachers hated that because it was cruel and it also left a mess. So the new rule is that you see a bug on a floor, you have to put a cup over it. And in some classes, we've had half of a dozen cups scooting around at once. Usually, one of the janitor collects all the cups and at the end of the day, sets the bugs free outside. But I guess on Wednesday, the janitor in charge of collecting the cups was out sick. So the night cleaning crew got a nasty surprise. Scream! Roaches aren't the only insects we've gotten issues with, though. Some honeybees have gotten in the classroom, the ceiling, and the eventually the school just decided to let them keep in. The insects are annoying, but if you ask me, the rottens are the real problem. Ever since the school canceled the exterminator, mice have been getting into the lockers and going through our lunch bags. It's gotten so bad that the school had to make a rule that everyone who brings lunch to school has to keep in front office. But you end up spending half a lunch period trying to figure out which round bag is yours. What's worse is that kids who have lunch in their earlier periods have started raiding our lunch bags and are taking our snacks. And sometimes they'll swap something that they didn't want from their bag which is how I ended up with a pickle instead of a chocolate chip cookie. 
I got tired of people stealing my lunch snack. I decided to do something about it. This week, I started bringing Manny's lunchbox to school, which has a lock on it. The Snurples. A couple of kids who have lunch right before us got curious about what was in my lunchbox and tried to bust it open. But I guess those metal boxes are built to withstand real beating. Because they couldn't crack it open no matter how hard they tried. Wham! It didn't really matter anyway. My snack was that day was a bag of sour cream and onion potato chips. But by the time I opened the chips, that turned into dust. I kind of wish the school would just cough up the money for an examinator because trying to take care of the problem themselves has created a pretty dangerous situation. The school set up mouse traps all over the building, so now you've got to be really careful about where you put your hands, especially in the library. I guess the school is just trying to save money wherever they can, and the latest place they're trying to cut back on is assemblies. Our school used to go out on assemblies. Last fall, we had three different authors come to our school, plus the illustrator of Commando Crocodile. A few weeks after that, a zookeeper brought in a bunch of exotic animals like penguins and an alligator that was 10 feet long. In February, we had an assembly where a scientist in a white lab coat and goggles did all sorts of cool experiments on stage. And even though it seemed a little dangerous, it was pretty cool. Rad science. Oosh. But I guess the school didn't have money for that type of thing anymore, and now our assemblies aren't anything to get excited about. Last week, we had an assembly called Living Presidents, where each president gave a speech about their time in office, but one actor did all the parts, and I'm pretty sure it was the same guy who played Clarence Cluster. And they probably shouldn't have let him have lunch in cafeteria afterwards because if you ask me, it kind of broke all the spell. Two fudge fingers, please. On Tuesday, we had an assembly that caused a big stir for all the wrong reasons. Randy from Randy's Reptile Review accidentally let one of his snakes get loose, which caused a total panic in the gym. Scream! The good news is that the snake was spotted in a hallway the next day. But I don't think anyone's going to tell Randy because that thing is single-handedly taking care of our rotten problem. Thursday. This money situation... At school is getting pretty serious and now teachers are starting to leave. Apparently, the whole teaching staff was supposed to get a raise this spring. But when Principal Bottoms told them it was going to happen, a few of them actually quit on the spot. This meant that all of a sudden, I didn't have a history teacher. So the school put Leonard Bray in charge of teaching since he'd been had back twice and this is the third time taking class. Industrial Revolution. Began in England, people moved to cities. Mr. From quit. Two, which means now Ms. Mrs. Lackey is the only social studies teacher in our grade. So they actually moved the wall between two classrooms, and now Mrs. Lackey can teach twice as many kids at once. Population growth. But even after some teachers left on their own, the school made more cuts to the staff. They switched Mrs. Massey from full-time to three days a week, and they let one of the school nurses go. So now we're down to just one. The new rule is that you're only allowed to go to the nurse's office if it is for something urgent, like a medical emergency. And each classroom has a sign next to the door to see if your situation qualifies. Stop. You really need to see the school nurse Please stay in class if you have a runny nose, hangnail, paper cut, blister, pimple, hiccups. Personally, I think the new policy is reasonable because I'm pretty sure that some kids were going to the nurse's office just to get out of class.
other kids were using the nurse as a free psychologist. I heard David Steen used to visit the nurse's office to talk about a sphere of undergo super volcanoes. Now every teacher has to take care of minor medical issues in the classroom from doing their actual jobs. Medical issues in the classroom, which is taking a lot of time away from doing their actual jobs. Yesterday, Mrs. Pritchard spent a whole career putting bandage on a kid who got injured making paper airplanes when she stepped out of the room. But teachers are doctors. And I don't love the idea of someone who's not qualified giving me medical treatment. So when I get a splinter in my butt from doing sit-ups on the gym floor, I decided I'd just wait until I got home to take care of it myself. Whoop. The people who got hit the hardest by all of these budget cuts were the janitorial staff, whose team went down from 10 to 3. And the worst part is that the janitor lost their jobs got replaced by a machine that cleans the floor. The school bought a second-hand robot from a local grocery store. At first, some kids were uncomfortable being around a faceless machine, so the school put googly eyes on it to make it seem a little more human. But if you ask me, it makes it even creepier. And I don't even know if it's such a great idea to have the machine cleaning up after everyone. Because now, just throw their trash on the floor since they know the robot will pick it. It's not even the students either. Teachers have been taking full advantage of having a cleaning robot in school. And I'm pretty sure Miss Slappy has been bringing the trash from home. I also think it was a mistake giving the robot eyes because now it thinks it's a person lately. It's been skipping out on its job and going to class with all their students. And yesterday, I'm pretty sure it was copying off my quiz and science. I just hope this thing doesn't get too smart, though, because it really wouldn't get if she started taking everyone's job. The robots are not the only ones schools getting free labor out of, though. They got the local prison to make furniture of our classrooms. And I'm not trying to complain or anything, but the rear legs on my chair in social studies are get six inches shorter than the front ones. Some of my inmates write their names on the furniture they made, and a guy named Justin carved a note on my desk that makes me sad every time I read it. Please ask my mom to call me. Sometimes they'll even draw pictures on the furniture, and someone sketched out a whole escape plan on the front of Miss Mr. Rock's desk, which is the school had to print out. May, Wednesday. It turns out the steps the school been taking to save money haven't been enough because now they're looking for a way to make money. And Principal Bottom's first idea was the Platinum High Flyers Club. The Platinum level is like the regular High Flyers Club, but the big difference is that you need to have kept good grades to be a member. You just need to be willing to fork over 12.99 a month. Or you need to have parents who are willing to pay a membership free. And Stephen Birch is lucky his folks made a ton of money in their construction business because with his grades, he had no chance of earning his way in. I tried to convince my parents to sign me up for the platinum level, but when my mom said I could join if I'd be willing to give up a monthly video game membership, I decided to drop the whole idea. I'm starting to rethink that decision, though, because the perks in the platinum level are way better than the free version. Starting with the premium seating, Principal Bottoms has a brother who owns a used furniture store, and he sold a bunch of leather cylinders to the school as a speed discount. Those things tilt all the way back to a live flat position, which makes things pretty uncomfortable for the people who sit behind them, especially during tests. The kids in the platinum level also get premium snacks like popcorn and full-size candy bars. 
So I'll bet the regular high flyers feel dopey about their tiny bags of peanuts now. The platinum high flyers don't even have to be in the classroom if they don't want to be, so they each get a platinum special pass, which lets them go wherever they want, whenever they want. Plus, they can use their platinum pass for all sorts of different things, like skipping the line at lunch, which is kind of annoying for everybody else. And even they get their own seating section in the cafeteria with tablecloths and real silverware instead of plastic utensils. And this week, they introduce table service to the platinum seating section, and so those kids don't even have to get up if they want a refill on the drinks reserved for platinum diners. The platinum high flyer club is causing some serious resentment from the teachers, too. The platinum kids complain a lot more than everyone else, and yesterday one of my classes got held up for 20 minutes after Marilyn Kindrich made a big stink about the view from her window seat. On top of that, the platinum kids are always either too hot or too cold, and now the teachers have to keep fresh blankets in the classroom. The things the teachers are maddest about is that with all the other members, to the High Flyers Club. The teacher's lounge is always full of kids, so now the teachers have to use the janitor's closet when they take their breaks. But the Platinum High Flyers Club isn't the only way the school is trying to make money. It's also selling corporate sponsorships. That's where a company pays a bunch of cash to put their logo somewhere in the school. Ever since Principal Bottoms gave the green light for these kind of deals, there are ads everywhere you look. When you walk through one of the hallways in our school, you'll feel like you're in the middle of Times Square, Midtown Aquarium, Clean Spring Water. There are ads all on the surfaces, including the water fountains, which some soda company pay a lot more money to sponsor it. Wouldn't you be rather drinking Purple Blast? There are even ads on the floors, and even and ever since Triple Decker Treats started putting stickers in the hallway, kids have been leaving school early to go to get ice cream. Follow the scoops to Triple Decker Treats. I don't think there's a place they won't put any ad, and at least a place they've put them inside are lockers. Smells like someone could use Clean Breeze. Bullseye Gostry even paid to put stickers in the urinals, and I'm actually glad they did because now the floors in the boys' bathroom are a lot less sticky. Bullseye Gostry, aim here for great prices. Companies that are willing to pay more sponsor whole rooms, which is why our English classroom is now Davidson Dictionary Center and Social Studies become the Island Gateway Travel Company Hub. The, company, the computer lab is sponsored by a computer that makes video games and when kids kind of crazy with their brandings. Now entering the Morlock State Computer Lab. They donated new computers with the one of their most popular game preloaded so now the school can forget about kids getting any work done in there. Crunch shop. Speaking of donations, companies that make luxury pajamas sponsor the teacher's lounge and stocked it with robes and slippers, so the kids in the high flyers club don't even bother going to classroom anymore. Teachers that are sponsored by Pampered loungewear, but you don't have to spend a fortune to get in an ad our, in our school because they're offering a ton of smaller sponsorship opportunities too. Even our staplers have an ads on them now. And your Johnny D's got you covered. Not sure every one of these sponsorships a good idea, though. A magazine inside of a science textbook. It feels to me like the school should be a little more choosy about who they take their money from. Science Scooper magazine, Flat Earth Theory, Fact or Fission. A few companies even signing exclusive deals to get their products in to the school. Now, all the vending machines are stocked with snacks from a company that makes spicy potato chips. Blistering hot chips. I guess blistering hot chips paid a lot of money to be exclusive salty snack supplier and such part of a deal nobody allows to have chips. 
from another company on school property. So if someone catches you with a different brand, then make sure you don't get to enjoy them. They also get product placement in the morning. New program, add the school stream into all the other classrooms. And I kind of feel bad for the students or partners who have to pretend like it. Yum. It's not the only morning program either. Blister and Hot Chick sponsors the school's newspaper, and these days it's hard to tell what's on an ad and what's on actual news. Student crier. Blister and Hot Chick's proven to increase popularity. It feels like there's no limit to what the school's willing to sell. Some plumbing company just bought the rights to the gymnasium. And there's apparently all sorts of stuff that comes with that. Their logo in the middle of the gym floor and on the clothes to have where the said. The plumbing company even replaced Budgie with their own mascot, which has been super popular with the students. Flushy. All these sponsorships are small potatoes compared to one thing the school's been holding out on, which is naming right for the school itself. They think there's a company that might be willing to pay big bucks that they put their name on the building. They even put on an ad on local paper to try to find a fiber. Fiber. Your name to me. We name our middle school. Imagine a company's name in boys on our building and see if that's all that is. But I guess there aren't a lot of companies willing to be connected with a school that doesn't have the best reputation because after getting zero pay grades, principal bottoms have to lower the asking rate. Eventually, someone put a bid to rename our school, but it wasn't a company, it was a town. It came from Slacksville, which we share a border, and we've been at war with those guys for years. They're still mad at us for getting the state to put a garbage dump on their side of the town line. So they tried to get their revenge by putting the twin turbine in the middle of the dump to blow the garbage smell back to the U.S. But it turns out wind turbines are by giant fans, so they are totally wasted with the money on that one. We decided to really stick it to Slicksville by putting up a billboard right on the border between our two towns. And apparently their property values went down by 30% after that. At least we don't live in Slacksville. So Slacksville planned to get us back to rename our middle school, but even though they were willing to pay Mr. Principal Bottoms, Decided to reject it anyway. Larry Mackell School name change form proposed by Slack School Rules Middle School. The school decided to lower the asking price again and finally got a take which was the examinator of those whose contract the school canceled a couple of weeks ago. The president of the company even came to the school to make offering personally. One eight zero zero deed box. And even though no one's thrilled, our new name is going to be 1800 Deed Bugs Middle School. Everyone seems to agree that it's still better than the name Slackwell came up with. Exterminator and the school put on a big press conference to announce the deal, and all the local stations came out to cover it. But the exterminated public should have waited until after his company got rid of pests in school, because I doubt the press conference was good for business. Local middle school renamed. Friday. Apparently, a lot of parents are thrilled with the new name of the school, and they don't like all the advertising we're being exposed to either. So they let Principal Bottom know about it at a PTA meeting. Now, Principal Bottom has a new school for Now, Principal Bottoms has a new scheme to raise money, and it's already created some pretty big changes at school. See you when you close to students.
The school figured they could get a lot of money by renting their classrooms to people who needed space. So now the ceiling is full of grown ups who are using the classrooms for all sorts of different things. Some of them rented classrooms for extra storage, and now they're filled with boxes that people couldn't fit in their garages. A few others have to set up rooms to do remote work so they don't even have to drive into the city every day, and some are even using the rooms to create their own businesses. One of my neighbors, Mrs. Jackson, started renting our whole McDonald's room, and she's using the room, she's using the oven store in a bakery, and now there's a line around the block for blueberry muffins every morning. Unfortunately, my science classroom is across the courtyard from the ceiling classrooms, and sometimes the smell of whatever she's baking is a little too much. Today, she made snickerdoodles smack in the middle of a pop quiz, and it drove everybody in my class totally wild. Snip, pan, pan. Speaking of distractions, someone turned on... Speaking of distractions, someone turned one of the rooms into a hot yoga studio and my mom attends to class, but no kid wants to see their mother in yoga pants, especially in the middle of school days. Hi, sweetie. It's not just the smell of the sights that are causing problems, it's the sounds too. There's a rock band of middle-aged guys who practice every day in one of the ceiling classrooms and they're really awful. Then there's the constant baking that echoes through the heating vents all day long. At first, I thought someone was using a room to run a canal or something, but it actually the police department is using our old art room at train at dogs. Snarl, chump. The only good news is that Neil Rancher managed to take back control of the room that was the honeybees took over. And now she sells bee wax panels and lip balm at the mall. I guess I'm glad that the school figured out a new way to make money, but it's bad for the new students. All our classes got packed into other two wings, and things have gotten more crowded than ever. Plus, now we have to share the cafeteria with the red cherry, which can be a little awkward. The school's not just renting out of classrooms, though. On Thursday night, they rent the gym to the high school for basketball games. But whenever there's a game, the fans completely trash our gym, and we have to clean up their mess the next day. Even though there is a policy against having food in the gym, the people who go to those high school games don't care. So there's always a ton of potato chip bags and half-eaten hot dogs under the ble bleachers. Some kids actually scavenge for leftover snacks and resell them in the cafeteria. Believe it or not, people will pay good money for food that's been on the floor. School rent out the gym on weekends too, and the reason I know that is because my church has been using the space while the pews are getting replaced. But it doesn't feel all right to have religious service in a place where we have visit uh, during the week because the whole time, all I can think about is everything else that is happening in gym. Rip. Mm. Saturday. Every year, the parents in the PTA put on an auction to raise money for the school. But this year, they wanted to make it bigger than ever to earn such as possible. They asked students to volunteer to help at the event. And since my mom is the secretary of the PTA, I got dropped into going. The PTA auction is pretty fancy at first, so I had to dress up for it. And my job was to walk around with a tray stacked with miniature pigs in a blanket all night. To be honest, it was a little awkward being around my parents when they were having fun with their friends. But I guess people with my mom and dad's age don't get a lot of chances to go out. So... They were probably just happy for the opportunity to cut loose, PTA auction. There were two parts of the night. The first part was silent auction, and then there were different prizes and gift baskets. You, you can win by being the highest fighter. 
And the way you do that is by writing down how much money you're willing to pay. I was hoping my parents would bid on something cool, like a week at a ski condo during winter vacation or a pair of jet skis. But the only item my mom put on her name was a wellness basket. And since she was the only biter, she won. A bunch of local companies that needed some quality items on the silent auction. East Bay Barbecue supplied a brand new outdoor grill and the Scouse kick in s'more kits without a dozen mugs of hot chocolate. Uh, but a few companies seem to be just trying to unload stuff they couldn't use. Assorted used toilet valves donated by GT Plumbing Supply. I'm pretty sure some companies donate very donate every year because Crawford Studios offered a family portrait, which is what they did for the last PT auction. And the reason I know that is because last year my family actually won it. When mom told us we were doing a family portrait, I was a little annoyed because it meant I had to dress up on Saturday, but it was actually a lot worse than that. I thought we were going to take a quick picture and I could enjoy the rest of my weekend, but it was a painting, which meant we had to go back five times. Halfway through the first session, Manny wouldn't sit still anymore, and the artist kept having to start the part of painting over. But Roderick was even worse because it didn't go back for the rest of the sessions. So the artist had to paint Roderick from memory, which is why the painting is in our basement and not above the fireplace in the family room. I don't want to repeat of that nightmare, which is why this year I wrote a made-up name on the biting sheet to make sure there was no chance our family actually won it. Family portrait, Tyler Richardson, Brang and Hawk. The next part of the night was the live auction, where they hired a professional auctioneer to get people to buy a bunch of special prizes. And since parents were all trying to outbid each other by raising their paddles, it actually got pretty wild. The first prize in the live auction was a chance for your kid to ride to school in a fire truck. Everyone seemed pretty excited about that one, and people started driving up the bids right from the start. Fire truck, 192, 23, 128. 182. I'm surprised they still offered the price after what happened last year, though. Lily Stumpsman's parents outbid everyone else, so their daughter got to ride the first truck to school. And I guess it was fun for a little while. But on the way there, an actual fire broke out at some restaurant downtown, and the firefighters had to race the building to deal with it. So Lily Stumpson ended up on the news, and I'm pretty sure she's still scarred by the whole experience. The next item for auction was just like the fire truck thing, only with the police squad car. Ricky Fisher's parents won it for the second year in a row, so I guess they figured it's good practice for him later on in life. The next item was lunch with the librarian. And Miss Massey fetched a lot of money since she's so popular with the kids. But they probably shouldn't have put let lunch with the janitor next because the guy they picked up for it always yells at us when we step on his clear floors. Nobody was willing to raise their pilots to start the bid, but it was pretty uncomfortable for a while there. But eventually, Mr. Gupta offered three bucks just to move things along. After that was over, the auctioneer announced the next prize, which was to have a teacher come to your house to do odd jobs. I'm surprised teachers agreed to do that one because I'll bet the last place that they went on the weekend is at some family's house fixing their mailbox or whatever. But that's actually what happened when my parents won that auction item one year. It's hard for me to imagine teachers having lives of their own, so it's always a little weird when you have to see them outside the school environment. It's 
always takes me a little off guard, especially when it happens in places you're not expecting it. Are you getting your summer reading done, Greg? The next prize was one they've been waiting doing for years, which is to raise money to get the principal to kiss the piglet. Principal Manny used to do it out of big assembly, and kids would go absolutely nuts. The auctioneer got things, and parents started driving the biting up. But Principal Bottoms walked on stage and said he couldn't do it because he's allergic to barn animals. So either he's telling the truth or he's just not the kind of person who's not kissing pigs. People moved on pretty quick because everyone was excited about the last five auction item, which was principal of the day. That was where a kid gets to sit in the principal office and do morning announcements and pretend they're in a charge for a few hours. It's kind of a dumb prize if you ask me, since the winner doesn't actually get any real power, but I guess every parent wants their kid to feel special. So as soon as the auctioneer started the biting, things got a little crazy. I noticed my mom put her pedal up. At first, I thought she was just trying to encourage other people to raise their bikes up to the prize up. But when I realized she was actually trying to win, the prizes kept climbing higher and higher, and people started dropping up. But every time someone raised the pedal, mom raised hers. And even the dad tried to stop her, mom was watching. It finally came down to the last two people, mom and Mrs. O'Malley. And there was some history between those two. They ran against each other to be PTA secretary. And after mom won, Mrs. O'Malley accused her of spreading rumors to scale the election, which mom derived. Denied. So this drove them was a personal. So this biting war was personal for them, and it didn't help that the crowd was egging them both on. I didn't think Mom or Mrs. O'Malley actually cared about the principle of the day thing anymore. They both just wanted to make sure the other person didn't win it. Eventually, Mrs. O'Malley came to her senses and dropped out of the run, which meant Mom was the top Bible. And from the way she reacted, you'd think she'd won a lottery. Yahoo! I don't think how much the final bite was. And to be honest, I don't even want to know. But I have a feeling there are going to be a lot fewer Christmas presents under the tree this year. Monday. This morning, I begged Mom not to make me go to school. Because she said principle of the day, things cost her fortune. She wanted to get her money's worth. She even made me wear a shirt, a tie, so I'd look official. I went to school and reported directly to the front office. I figured Principal Bottoms would have me do the morning announcement and maybe tag along with him for a few hours. But when I got to his office, he seemed annoyed. That's that I was a few minutes late. Principal Bottoms handed me a name tag and set of keys that said could get me into any room of the building, Principal. Then he wished me luck and took off, which meant I was on my own. Woo! Squeal! So we had the principal's office all to myself, which was actually pretty sweet. And I thought that if it was it feels like to be in charge, I could definitely get used to it. Aha! Uh -huh. But the moment last didn't last long because three minutes after being bell rang, school secretary came in with a pile of papers and told me I needed to go through all the days we know. It was all bills and repair estimates and a bunch of boring stuff I didn't even understand. But before I was halfway through opening the envelopes, the school secretary brought me some checks. She said I needed a sign. I didn't even know if it was legal for a kid of my age to sign a check, but I figured these people probably needed to get paid, so I scribbled my name down on each one. In the middle of signing checks, I got interrupted again. This time, the secretary said there was a problem in the boys' bathroom in the B-wing that I needed to deal with. Some idiots had ripped a sink off the wall, and I'd be willing to bet it was Mary, Marty Winston. So now a pipe was busted and it was flooding the bathroom with water. 
gosh. I went to find a janitor and handle the problem, but they said plumbing repair wasn't in their contract, so there was nothing they could do about it. By now, things were really getting out of hand with the flooding situation. Because there was water in the B-Wing hallway. A bunch of kids had grappled lunch trays from the cafeteria and were totally going nuts. Woo! I knew it would take forever to get the plumbers out to the school, so I went back to the janitors to try to strike a deal. I told them if they fixed the leak in the bathroom, I'd give them this Friday off. But I guess those guys couldn't tell if they had me over a barrel. And they pushed for even more. Janitor came up with the whole list of demands. Like better dental care, longer breaks, and the chance of work remotely on Mondays and on Wednesdays. Even though I didn't know if I technically had the authority to agree to all this stuff, I figured that if I didn't, then the whole B-Wing would be underwater before the end of the day. After the situation was under control, I wanted to just go back to my office and take it easy until lunch. But when I got there, I was in for a surprise because there were a bunch of kids waiting outside my door. They were a few of the biggest troublemakers in my grade. The teachers sent them to the principal's office, which meant that now I had to deal with them. The thing is, I knew I couldn't come down too hard on these kids because I was going to have to face the next day when I was in principal. So I gave each of them a peep talk and told them to try to make better choices. I made sure to send each one away with a lollipop to stay on their good side. But that turned out to be a big mistake because once word got back to the rest of the students, that the principal was handing out candy for being bad, it caused a big stir. All of a sudden, kids were acting out in class to get sent to the principal's office. And it wasn't just the regular troublemakers either. In fact, one of them was Alex Arda, who's the smartest kid in my grade, and a big fan of lollipops, apparently. Wrong! After I finally got finished dealing with the bad kids, I had to deal with the good ones. And since this was the first time of any of them had ever been sent to the principal's office, they seemed a little stressed out to be there. I didn't have time to deal with all of those people, though, because the secretary told me I was already late for the weekly staff meeting in the conference room. When I got there, I could tell from the looks on everyone's faces that this wasn't going to be a lot of fun. And I was right about that. As soon as I sat down, the teacher launched into their complaints, which covered everything from how many dry erase markers each one of them gets to high flyer clubs using their lounge for long. Everyone was talking at once, and I couldn't even make out what anyone was saying. So I came up with a rule like grab a stapler and told the teachers that if someone wanted to talk, they had to be holding the stapler. And that worked for a little while. Mr. Lackley gripped up about how teachers should get to part their car closer to the building, which seemed pretty reasonable to me. But she kind of went on and on, and I realized we should probably create a time limit for how long you're allowed to hold the stapler. Before I could announce their new rule, Mr. Ball snatched the stapler from Mr. Lackley so he could talk about his, his issues. And since it's six foot seven, there was a lot anyone could do about it. It turns out Mr. Horace keeps the miniature stapler in her purse. So she wiped it out and started complaining that the teacher should get free milk in the cafeteria. Even though everyone seemed to agree with her, nobody liked the fact that she was breaking the rules by using an unofficial stapler. <laughs> People started grabbing at it. And somehow, Mr. Tupa ended up with the miniature stapler attached to his ear. We had to pause the meeting so he could go to the nurse's office and have it looked at. Shriek! I decided the stapler idea wasn't working, so I tried a different approach. The new deal was that if you wanted to talk, you had to raise your hand and wait to be acknowledged, which was a rule all the teachers seemed to understand. Oh, 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 me, me. 
I called him Mrs. Shelburn first, who has a beef with Miss Pritchard over a computer. The school bought a new laptop to replace a broken one, and they gave it to Miss Pritchard. But Miss Shelburne thought that seems she's been out of school longer, and she deserves the new laptop. The two of them started going at it in front of everybody, and they actually had to be separated. I thought they had a pretty valid claim to the new computer, but I think of the, but I couldn't think of a solution that would make them both happy. Then I remembered the story from Sunday school about the wise king who had to deal with this exact same kind of thing. I told the two teachers that they could split the laptop down the middle and get each half. I figured out one of them would just let the other have the computer because half is no good to anyone. But I guess I underestimated how much these two teachers didn't want the other one to have the new laptop because they split it right down the middle and each took a half. But the end of the meeting, I really needed to break, and it wasn't off the hook yet. A few of the ceiling renters were waiting outside my office, and I couldn't even imagine what this was going to be about. Apparently, the police dogs into a batch of Mrs. Jackson's oatmeal raisin cookies, so she wanted the police department to pay for her lost profits. But the police said Mrs. Jackson was negligent for leaving the doors of her classroom unlocked, and she, since raisins are toxic to dogs, they wanted her to pay their veterinarian bills. And I didn't even know where to start with that one. Luckily, I didn't have to deal with it right then because Vice Principal Roy came on the last week and said everyone needed to come down to the gym for a special assembly. I had no idea what the assembly was about, but I honestly didn't care as long as I didn't have to actually do anything. But it turns out I was wrong about that. When I saw the STEM stage, I realized why Principal Bonham was so eager to leave school today. Fuck her up, Principal. I tried to turn around and head back to my office, but there was already a wall of students blocking my way. So I knew there was no way getting out of it. And if you were ever curious about what it's like to kiss a pig, it's often not as bad as this thing. I'm sure I had a few more hours in the clock, but by then I pretty much had my fill being in charge. So I left a note on the school secretary desk and gave myself permission to leave a little early from the principal's desk. I quit. To Tuesday. After being principal of the day, I was pretty happy. I just got back to being a regular student for the rest of the year. But when I got to school this morning, I found out that things are about to change for everyone. The student paper comes out on Tuesdays, and even though it's free, I don't usually bother grabbing a copy. But this time, I could tell they had broken a big story. Extra, extra. According to the front page, the state is planning on closing the school, and the only way it can stay open if we bring our scores up on standardized test next week. But based on the way things have been going on this year, it doesn't seem like there's any chance that's happening. I know this news is a big deal and all, but our but our student paper is always super dramatic with their headlines, and this time wasn't any different. The student cried, this end is near. Middle school to close if scores don't improve. Apparently, Principal Bottoms actually know about this for a while, but I guess he didn't want to cause a panic right before we took the standardized test. The only reason the student paper found out about it at all is because they had a spy in front office. This reporter named Freddie Larkin had been faking injuries for the past two weeks so he could go to the nurse office, which is right outside the conference room, and somehow nobody caught on what he was up to. But the school probably should have 
broken the news themselves because now everyone's in a panic. And nobody knows what's going to happen to us if the school is closed. The article said that if the state shuts us down, they're going to split everyone up and send us to two different schools in neighboring towns. One of the schools is Folsom Tech, which is just opened last year and is supposedly really nice. In fact, I've heard some crazy things about how nice it is. Albert Sandy says their lunch menu was created by some famous chef, and they've even got a meat carving station at the cafeteria. They also have a massage therapist in, on staff to help kids reduce their stress and a room with napping pods when students need a break. Their assemblies are pretty top shelf, too. Last year, they had a Formula One drive and a team of astronauts who were headed to Mars, which kind of makes Randy Reptile Review seem a little cheesy by comparison. If you end up getting sent to Folsom Tech, you're all set. It's the other place everyone's worried about is Slackwell's Middle School. Slackwell's building is older than ours, and it doesn't have air conditioning. They can't even open their windows to get some fresh air when the weather is warm because the middle school is right next to the state dump. Pen, 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 mop, mop. It's not just the students who are worried about what's going to happen to them. It's about the teachers, too. They know if that school closes, they could lose their jobs. So, at this point, Mr. Pitchard has given up on teaching geometry completely because she's trying to plan for her future. So, the rest of the staff has started looking too. Our newest janitor even posted something on the bulletin board to see if he can get to work when his whole thing blows up. Available for odd jobs, house cleaning, small motor repair, dog walking. Thursday, I got seriously good news yesterday. The student's paper found out which kids are going where if the school closes, and they posted the list on the bulletin board in the main entrance. And I'm happy to say that if we shut down, I'm headed to Folsom Tech. I thought the way the school would split us up would be sending kids whose last name started with A to M to one place, and the kids whose last started started with N to Z to other. But I guess they wanted to be fair, so they did it by alternating between names. That's lucky for me, but not so lucky for Jenna Helly and Elfisano Hendricks. Helly, Jenna, Slackwell, Healthy, Greg, Olsen, Jack, Hendricks, Elfonso, Slackwell. Unfortunately, Rolly's didn't, name didn't fall in the right spot, which means he'll be going to Slackwell. <laughs> And even though I told him I'd bring home leftover prime rib from the Folsom Tech cafeteria every day, it didn't seem to cheer him up anyway. Rolly's all stressed out. So are half the other kids at my school. Their only hope at this point is that the school does well on the standardized test and the state doesn't shut them down. A few kids' parents even hired private tutors to help them study, and Dolly's parents got him a different tutor for every single subject. And that stinks for me because it means he doesn't have any free time to hang out after school. I think Dolly's parents went a little overboard with this tutoring stuff, though. They even got him a phys ed tutor, and I'm pretty sure none of that stuff was going to be on the test. Friday. Things are changing faster at school than I can keep up with. A few parents decided to just pull the plug and send their kids to private school instead. And I'm not going to say I was sad to see Marty Vincent go. Danny Tank's friend decided to pull him out too, which meant I finally had a locker for myself. Then something happened that made a giant mess of things. Alex Ardua's parents decided they didn't feel like waiting, so they enrolled him in boarding school on the other side of the state. 
but since he's got a name at the front of the alphabet, it had a ripple effect through the whole list. Now, every kid was supposed to go to Stocksville is going to Folsom Tech, and every kid who was supposed to go to Folsom Tech has headed to Stockwell instead. And everyone found out the student paper posted on the new list, Vulcan Day. Things got flipped upside down, and all the kids in my group were totally thrown for a fluke. But everyone else was on top of the world, and you'd think that kids like Jenna, Helly, and Alfonso Hendricks might be a little more concentrated about celebrating around the rest of us. A bunch of kids tried to convince this girl named Eva Arson to drop out and go to private school, but if she did, she would flip the list back to how it was. But I guess she was really looking forward to those napping pods because even after we offered her all our snacks, she wouldn't budge. On the walk from school, Rolly said he'd bring me his leftovers from the meat carving station every day, and I know he was just trying to make me feel better, but for some reason, it really got on my nerves. I tried to get my parents to pull me out of school and send me to school with perks like they have at Folsom Tech. But even after I went over all the benefits, they said private schools was too expensive. Monday, I figured the only chance I had of changing my situation was to do my best on that standardized test and hope everyone else did their part. So this weekend, I hit the books. The problem is it's not easy catching up on a whole year of school, and I didn't even know where to start. I tried to give myself little breaks every now and then to keep myself motivated, but I guess I got a little carried away because I ended up spending more time reading romance novels than school textbooks. I realized my strategy wasn't working, so I decided to try a totally different approach. I figured out if I surrounded myself with my textbooks, I might be able to just absorb all the information in my brain somehow. But I don't think it really worked, because when I woke up this morning, I didn't feel any smarter. On top of that, the ink they used to print those textbooks was must be really cheap, because I ended up with a periodic table of elements stuck to my cheek. You can tell a lot of kids are really nervous about the test tomorrow because they're doing all sorts of crazy things for good luck. Some people have been bringing horseshoes and other good luck charms to school. And Ricky Fisher has been selling trinkets, which ways will get your math score up by 20%. Some kids think it's good Look, if you only step on the red tiles on the sick school force, but others say the red ones are bad luck. And that's creating a dangerous situation in the hallway. I feel especially bad for this kid everyone calls lucky the way I heard it. I mean, he almost got struck by lightning playing golf with his dad, which is how he got his nickname, Zoo. Everybody's saying if you rub Lucky's head, his luck will rub off on you. So everyone's been trying to get a piece of him. Now Lucky's got a bald spot, and I'm hoping for his sake it's not permanent. Some people are so desperate to do well on this test that they even turn to the statue of Larry Mark. They've been leaving camels and making offerings to his shoes in hopes that somehow it'll help. But if the school said it was a fire hazard, so they had to clear the stuff out. All I can say is that if you were counting on Mary and Mark's feet to save us tomorrow, we could be in even more trouble than I thought. Tuesday. Today was the day of the big standardized test, which was scheduled to start at 8.30 and be over at noon. And even though I did my best to prepare for it, I was still nervous about it because I've never been a great test taker. The problem is that I get distracted really easily. So if someone in the room is humming or chewing gum, it totally breaks my concentration. And since half of the kids in my grade didn't even really care how they did on this thing, there were way more distractions today than usual.
I really wish I had thought ahead and brought some noise canceling headphones or something to block out the sound. The only kid in the room who could actually focus was Lucky, who wore a helmet to stop people from rubbing his head. I felt a little better knowing Lucky was trying to do well on the test because he's pretty smart, and I figured he'd go get our test scores up. I also knew we couldn't count on Andrew Huck to be on one to come through for us. But the bigger problem was that the kids who were headed to Folsom Tech because I realized they weren't even going to try to do well. In fact, I su suspected those kids were trying to do bad on purpose. And when I peeked at Jenny Hilly's answer sheet, that pretty much confirmed it. I figured out the only thing I could do was try my hardest and hope for the best. The test itself was practically impossible, and it felt like whoever wrote the question didn't actually want anyone to succeed. Please fill the choices in the best answers above. A1, B1, and C. C1, 2, but not 4. D, all of the above. E, none of the above. In the end, none of it mattered anyway. A half hour... Into the test, a bee flew in the room, and nobody seemed to notice except me. But one bee was followed by a whole swarm of bees a minute later, and we all had to evacuate the classroom. It turns out the snake that escaped from the assembly got into the room the police were rending in the sea room and totally freaked out the dogs, so the dogs busted down their door to escape. Bark, bark, bark. The beekeeper got curious about all the commotions in the hallway and cracked open the door, which was a huge mistake. Bees got into our classrooms and all the students had to wait in the parking lot while the fire department took care of the situation inside. And this was one of those times when it would have been really nice to have more than one school nurse. Monday, our school sunrise test scores came back and let's just say the results weren't good. Nobody even got past the math section, and apparently the state didn't give you a do-over if the classrooms get invaded by these. That meant our school officially closed on Friday, and students paper marked it with one last special edition, and even though I haven't had a ton of fun in this place, the all felt like a sad day. The students cry, it's over. Middle school to close its doors for good. Not everybody was broken up about the school closing, though the kids who were going to Fulton Tech seemed pretty jacked, and Miss Lackey was excited to head off on a cruise with her husband. But the person the most excited was Principal Bottoms, and now that I think of it, he's probably been checked out for a while. Woohoo! They were the start of new life as a Sparksville middle school student, but if every day was going to be like this one, I could have been in a rough side. First of all, I had to get up a whole hour earlier to catch the bus, which meant it was still kind of dark. And it's a little depressing because at the bus stop, when the moon is still out, but it got worse from there since I'm the only kid in my neighbors who went to Sparksville. That can't put me on a regular bus. That meant they had to spend some time to pick me up for school. Sudsy Colrush, pet boom. And even though I like dogs, I'm the type of person who needs their space in the morning. Pen, pen, boosh. I tried to tell myself it wasn't so bad. But that before once of the groomers washed the Big Saint Bernard, and he shook himself off midwinds. Gah! If you ask me, the first day at a new school is hard enough without smelling like a wet dog. Saxville Middle School. I thought there might be some kind of official welcome for the students, but I'm not so sure anyone even knew we were coming. Kind of glad they didn't make a big deal of it, though, because I get some hard looks when I'm walked down the hallway. Boop. At least I was smart enough to not wear any gear from an old school Andrea Hawk 
had on a looter shirt. And he might as well have been wearing a target on his back. Wow! Nobody gave us a schedule, so when the bell rang, I stepped into the nearest classroom where the English teacher was reading a picture book that was way below our grade level. That's when I started to realize that the quality of education was even lower at this school than it was than the one I came from. In social studies? In social studies? They were using textbooks that were at least 20 years old. In geometry, they were going over stuff we covered a really long time ago. In science, they had the same type of equipment we had at our school, but I'm pretty sure they were just burning stuff for fun. That wasn't the only thing that was a little off, though, in Frisette. We used full-size softballs for the dodgeball unit. The special of the day in the cafeteria was a fried fish patty between two slices of pepperoni pizza. Even though the school assembly was entertaining, it didn't seem to have any actual educational value. So I'm trying not to get too comfortable here. Based on my experience from the first day, I'd be willing to bet Slacksville is going to be the next school to close Friday. The nice thing about being in a place where the expectations are a little lower is that you give a chance to shine and not to brag. But I'm pretty sure I'm one of the smartest kids at my new school. People are starting to notice too. I overheard a kid asking his friend how much time was left in class, so I told him. And they were both amazed I knew how to read a regular clock. Word got around, and now everyone at school is calling me Time Lord. I don't know if I should be proud of knowing how to tell the time, but I guess when you're the new kid, you need to take what you can get. But then my fame reached a whole new level. We were making fudge brownies in home. When I looked in the fridge to see what other ingredients they had, I realized I could whip something that would guarantee me an A in the class. Choo-choo. The dots of fudge dogs were introduced in Slack's Road Mill School, and even though I left kind of bad for giving away my old school secret recipe, I figured it didn't really matter anymore. The clock thing made me popular, but the fudge dogs made me famous. And now all of a sudden, I had a ton of friends in the cafeteria. But the best part was when I started getting a few female admirers, which never happened at my old school, I noticed a couple of girls were whispering about me in the hallway, and one named Sophie came over and asked a question, and even though I could tell she was just looking for an excuse to talk, I didn't really mind. Can you tell me what my watch says? Things moved pretty fast. From there, Sophie and I ate lunch together for the rest of the week, and when she held off my hand in the hallway, that made it official. But even though I'm really enjoying it, what the two of us going on at school, it really won't mean anything until we go on actual dates, the movies or something. Because we're starting to run out things to talk about at lunch, and there's the only many fudge dogs the person can eat. Saturday. I worked up the nerve to ask Sophie to go on a date, and she said yes. But since neither one of us can drive, that meant we'd go and get on of our parents to do it. I really didn't want either of my parents driving because I knew that Tobin embarrassed me in front of the girl. So Sophie asked her dad to take us to the movie, and he said he would. I waited out in front in my front yard, and when I saw a car driving slowly down our street, I knew it must be them. And one looked at her dad's fancy car told me their family must have a lot of money. I saw the car's license flat before I noticed I was driving it, and that's when I realized I'd never asked Sophie her last name. Mac Jr. Sophie never mentioned that her dad was Larry Mac Jr. And if she had, I probably would have had the courage to ask her out. But now here he was in front of my house, and he didn't look too thrilled to be there either. He can hop in the back. 
It turns out Sophie didn't tell her dad what town I lived before she asked him to pick me up, and that might have actually been on purpose. Because from the way he was acting, he didn't seem too thrilled to be in a neighborhood on the other side of the tracks. Oh. I'd never met someone as same as with Larry Mac Jr., so I was a little nervous. I tried to talk to him about car stuff, but I probably made myself sound dumb. So just 24 inches chromers on your wheels. When we got to the movie theater, he actually came inside with us, and I'm not sure if we really wanted to see the movie or if he was just there to keep an eye on us. Uh-huh. After the movie, we went to a place that sells burgers and shapes. I was hoping Sophie's dad would wait in the car, but he followed us in there, too. As soon as we sat down, Larry Mac Jr. started grilling me. He wanted to know what kind of kids I hung out with and what my parents did for a living, and even what kind of car they drove. It was pretty clear I didn't think a person like me was good enough for his daughter. Lucky and I got a break when a waiter came to the table and handed us our menus. It took me a second to recognize him. Though. Isca a puto gragrigro. It was Mr. Layton, my old Latin teacher. I was a little surprised to see him working in a place like this, but I was happy to see a friendly face. We got a conversation, and all my Latin came rushing back. After we made small talk about the weather and stuff like that, I placed an order with three hamburgers and three chocolate milkshakes, which seemed to really impress Sophie's dad. Troso, ambrogroso, guayam shimpuso, si bien. All of a sudden, Larry Mac Jr. started acting totally different towards me. And I wanted to know what kind of student I was if I had any other talents I could share with him. Sophie told her dad I could tell the time using the wheel clock, which unfortunately it didn't seem to impress him as much as it did to my classmates at Slack School this year. Then she told him that I invested fudge, invented fudge dogs, which did seem to impress him. For the rest of the night, we just talked about it takes to run a successful business. I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but if things were worse with Sophie, my future might be totally different. And I'd definitely be willing to change my last name if that what it took to be a part of family business. Tell him the max sent off. June Monday. A lot has changed since my date with Sophie, and none of it is good for me. Lady Mac Jr. decided the reason I was such a bright kid was because of the education I received at Larry Mac Middle School. So he donated a ton of money to reopen, but this time with the meaning. The student career. Hey, Millionaire Rescue Shattered School, Larry Mac Jr. Middle School. He even updated the statue in front courtyard to mark the reopening. Even though it cost Larry Mac Jr. a fortune to reopen the school, he got his money back right away. That's because when the workers started renovation in the seaway, they discovered bags in the cash of the walls. When the school reopened, me and all my kids who got sent to Slack School and Falkland Tech had to come back, and not everyone was thrilled about the news. In fact, I think most of the people were happy at their new schools. So all of a sudden, I'm the villain of getting our school reopened. Jerk. Sophie didn't want to date long distance, so when I switched schools, she broke up with me. But I'm thinking I might have actually dodged a bullet on that one. Dear Greg, it's over. I still see her dad almost every day, so I guess inspired him to get back to school and complete his education. So now he's in half my classes. Mm -hmm. And he must have a lot of pull with my school because he managed to get Mr. Layton rehired. Oh, no, God, so it's on us. Oh, God, I met Larry Mack Jr. doesn't go to school full time because he's still got a car dealership to run and apparently isn't feeling better than ever 
with their new promotion. Free sponge dogs with new Vesco prices. Speaking of which, now the town now the town of Slacksville is claiming that they invented fudge dogs and now even put out a billboard. Welcome to Slacksville, the home of fudge dogs. In fact, Slacksville patented the recipe, which means we're not allowed to sell fudge dogs in our cafeteria anymore. Lately, our school's been trying out some new food items, but so far, nothing's really taken off, namely gloves. When the school reopened, they tried to get Principal Bottoms back to finish out the year. But from what I've heard, he's got a place in the Caribbean and has enjoyed his new life. So they are the temporary replacement until they find someone to put me. But if they had end up sticking up with a new guy, I exchanged concerns about what my position is headed. 